Section 3.2, Newton's first law of motion. This section is about inertia, balance force, and Newton's first law of motion and its application. Galileo conducted a thought experiment, analyzing the motion of the ball in descending horizontal and ascending floor in absence of friction. If the ball will roll down and then horizontally, and then is going to ascend to the third floor ramp, then it's going to at attempt to reach the same height as it started. This can be explained with a law of conservation of energy, when a gravitational potential energy is converted to a kinetic energy and then back to a gravitational potential energy. But for now, let's actually uh, think about for a second a ramp. If that ramp is less steep, ball will continue to move at the again to reach at the same height. But what now if the third ramp doesn't even exist? So we have descending and horizontal only, so the ball will never stop because it cannot reach that certain height it, as it started. If you have tried to play table hockey, that small plastic pack moves with a uniform velocity after you hit it because there is very little friction acting on the pack to slow it down. So that means air, that's a table air. The air that is blowing uh, underneath the pack is keeping that pack floating on a table to reduce at a maximum to reduce force of friction. So the net force is zero. There's no reason for the pack actually to slow down if there's a minimum friction. If you turn off the air, then you'll see the pack doesn't go that far because of the friction stops it. If you do not hit the puck at all, the puck is going to stay there at rest. Although there are force of gravity and force of, uh, or normal force acting on the puck. So that means that even if there's, the object is at rest, that means that the forces are still acting it, but they are balance forces. Forces are canceling each other. Net force is zero. Those, ex those experiments, even a thought experiments from Galileo, and this experiment or playing at a table hockey can be explained with the concept of inertia. So inertia is a property of matter that causes it to resist changes in motion. Inertia is directly proportional to the mass. So the bigger the mass, bigger the inertia. So in order to understand resist in motion, that means that object will tend to keep its motion if the object is moving will continue to move, and if the object is staying at rest, will continue to stay at rest. So inertia is a property of matter that causes it to resist changes in motion, and inertia is directly proportional to a mass. Those two important things are base of the first Newton law. In order to understand the uh, uh, connection between inertia and mass, you can think about uh, how difficult it is to move a heavy object compared to a lighter object. So actually, when you move, you change its state from rest to moving. Or other way around, it is so hard to stop moving a massive object. So you are still trying to change its motion from moving to rest. 
Now it's another, um, let's see that picture here. It's another way to explain inertia is by uh, analyzing your experience if you are sitting on a bus. Take a look. If the bus start on a right, on a left, I'm sorry, uh, then the person is moving or leaning backward. So why this person body is moving backward when bus starts moving forward? That can be explained with inertia because any mass in body, people, has a mass. Any mass has a tendency to stay at a previous state. So when a bus starts moving, it starts moving you as well as you are sitting on a bus. However, especially uh, your, your body or the head that is free has a tendency to move backward to stay at the previous state, at the previous location. So what about when a bus stops? Similar, when a bus stops and you already are moving with a bus at a certain speed and bus slow down, that means it's changed. The bus changed its motion and with the bus you are changing your motion as well. So that's why your head is leaning forward and your body is leaning forward because it has a tendency to keep moving at that previous rate. Here is another experiment to think about inertia. If you're flying on, a, on an airplane and the plane is flying horizontally at a constant speed, you may not feel anything what is going around. As a matter of fact, if you have a tennis ball, for example, on a table in front of you, the tennis ball will move with a you, with a chair, and with flight at the same constant speed. However, relative to you, the ball will look like it's not moving at all. However, if the plane rapidly gains speed, accelerate, then you're going to see the tennis ball will move toward back or backward toward you. So that means it is trying to keep moving at the same rate as before, before the plane gained that speed, accelerated, changed the speed. In the same way, your body will react while sitting as well. And we talked about before how you react if the bus is speeding up or slowing down. So they, both of those uh, reactions are connected with inertia. Both are connected, either you or tennis ball uh, moving the way you are moving if the, uh, if changes in a speed happen, in a velocity happen, then it is inertia that make that happen. Here are some animation actually to see that uh, how you're going to react if you are moving and suddenly it, it, you are forced to stop moving. And that actually happened to a people or to any object that has a mass. If you see that person that did not uh, uh, wear the seat belt for after the sudden stop is going to fly, actually is going to continue moving at the same rate. It's going to continue to keep that state of motion. On, a, on animation below is a ladder that actually flies off the car, truck, after truck suddenly stop. It's the same way both uh, animations are explained uh, with inertia.
First Newton's law is about inertia. It's about balance forces. So if net force on an object is equal to zero, that means forces are balanced, are canceling each other, then the object is in equilibrium. An object could be in a static equilibrium, so when it is at rest, if F net is equal to zero, so velocity is zero as a result, acceleration is zero as well. What about if the object or person is moving at a constant velocity? As moving with a constant velocity, that means that final and initial velocity is the same because it's constant. As final and initial velocity is the same, there is no change in velocity. As a result, acceleration, which is a change in velocity per interval of time, has to be zero as well. So, in a dynamic equilibrium, F net is equal to zero, acceleration is zero. After understanding the concept of inertia, you should be uh, ready now to uh, learn the first Newton's law of motion. So the law of inertia is now is called Newton's first law of motion because it was included with the Newton's other law of motion. So first Newton's law is about inertia and it's about balance forces, it's about equilibrium. So, first Newton law of motion says, if the net force acting, if the ext net external force on object is zero, then the object will remain at rest or continue to move at a constant velocity. So, that means that it will continue the same state as before. In a short way, we can actually write the first Newton law this way, if F net is equal to zero, then velocity has to be zero or constant. That means that velocity is zero, the object is at rest, and velocity constant, that means that the object is moving at a constant velocity. An object that obey first Newton law is in an equilibrium in one dimension and in a two dimension as well. So if we can, if we say the F net is zero, that means F net on the X axis has to be zero and F net on the Y axis has to be zero as well. There's a wide range of technologies that take advantage of first Newton law including in automobiles, planes, rocket, and construction. Seat belt is an easy uh, application of the first Newton law or inertia because it has to do with a change in motion. So seat belt will work like that. If a sudden change in the motion uh, automobile motion, cars motion, or the person that is wearing the seat belt motion, then the seat belt will lock itself. So is a, if you see there's a pendulum there, if there's a change in motion, the pendulum will lock the seat belt. So it's going to restrain the person that is wearing the seat belt from moving for uh, from moving forward. You can try actually to see the, um, the seat belt is working by wearing the seat belt and trying to pick up something on a floor uh, while you are wearing the seat belt. You're going to see that seat belt will lock you. You can pick up the, the thing on a floor slowly and seat belt will allow you slowly change in motion. However, 
if you do that a sudden change it will lock itself so it's a double protection in the seat belt change in motion of the person that is wearing the seat belt and a change in motion of the car itself will automatically lock a seat belt so the key idea here is that the net force must be zero for any object to remain at rest or keep moving at a uniform velocity. Otherwise, the object will accelerate. So, the both a seat belt that we already explained and a headrest protect drivers and passengers from sudden change in velocity, so acceleration. If you see that if, without a headrest, if the car will accelerate forward, suddenly will accelerate forward, head, which is free to move, will keep staying at the previous state at rest. So that's why the head is leaning backward, which will uh, cause the neck injury. On a picture on the right, you're going to see that the headrest is protecting the head from moving drastically backward. Here we have some practice uh, with the balance forces, or, or F net is equal zero. The object in this free body diagram is at rest. Find the missing force, which in this case is the force of gravity. We don't have anything on the X axis, so we can label positive direction up, for example. And then we can say F net Y is equal F1 Y plus F2 Y plus F3 Y. So F1 is 12 Newton, F2 is 8 Newton, and F3 is FG in this case. So you can solve for FG, which is minus 20 Newton or 20 Newton down. That's another one. In this case, we have both X and Y, so we can actually label a positive direction on the top. Uh, that is, top one is positive and the right one is positive. So we can start with a Y, which has uh, have two forces. F net Y is equal zero. That means F net Y is sum of all forces. How many forces we have here? Two. F1 Y plus F2 Y is equal zero. F1 is minus 22, F2 is Fn in this case, is unknown. So we can solve for Fn, which is 22 Newton, or 22 Newton up. On the x-axis, we have three forces. So F net is equal F1x plus F2x plus F3x is equal 0. So F1 is unknown, which is F1x. F2x in this case is 15 minus 15 Newton. And other one is a positive 28 Newton. You can solve for F1 uh, by moving both on the other side of the equation. And we have 13 minus 13 Newton or 13 Newton left. Here is another example. The object on this free body diagram is at rest. Find the missing forces. As you see, there are two missing forces on, on uh, x and y axis. We can label up as a positive and right as positive. So let's start with the y axis. F net on y is equal F1y plus F2y is equal 0. So what we have, we have a positive 13,000 Newton plus Fg is equal 0. So obviously, Fg is going to be minus 13,000 Newton or 13,000 down on X. F1, F net uh, X is equal F1X plus F2X plus F3X is equal 0. What we have there, F1 is uh, the missing force. And then we have two negative forces, there are two on the left minus 1,250 and 1,400. 
move those both and the other side of the equation becomes both positive and it's a 2650 newton or 2650 newton right uh, here is another example for the diagram on the right what is the magnitude and direction of the force necessary to produce equilibrium so we're talking about a missing force which is not even drawn there because we do not know magnitude and we do not know direction so we cannot draw so what we can do is a label or draw x and uh, x and y axis label the forces and resolve them into component how to do it from the tip of those uh, forces we can draw perpendicular to x and perpendicular to y and do the same thing for other one and then we can draw component starting from same origin for few f1 f1x and f1y and for the other one is f1 f2x and f2y i didn't uh, label f2y there because it's too narrow but this is F1Y, and this is F2Y. This is F1X and F2X. So using a Sokatoa or a trigonometry, you can uh, uh, resolve those two vectors. The same thing that we learned in a unit one. Uh, if you see that Y y component f1 y is in front of 60 and another the same thing is for the y component of the f2 is in front of uh, angle 30 while f1x and f2x happen to be adjacent for both 60 and other one 30 degree so that's what we do f1x is f1 cosine 60 which is minus it's negative make sure you put the negative and positives there because it's very important when you are going to find total and f1 y is positive it's up positive so it's sine 60 which is 6.93 so F1 is 8 Newton, so 8 Newton sine 60 is 6.93. F2 X is F2 cosine 30. And F2, if you see, is 5. It's a 5 Newton. So 5 Newton cosine 30 is 4.33 Newton. It's positive and f2y is f2 that means 5 times sine 30 is 2.5 newton now you can add all x's together and they have to add up to a zero so f1x plus f2x and f3 if you see that f3 we didn't even bother to do because we know that is an, on a y axis and x component of f3 is zero and y component of f3 is f3 itself plus a missing force on x component so as f4x is equal to zero so f or f4x is what we are looking for and that is minus 0 0.33 newton so we can draw it negative on the left we do the same thing for y axis so we have f1y f2y f3y as i said f3y is already f3 itself so it's a minus nine you can make sure the signs are correct f1y is a plus 6.93 and f2y is a plus 2.5 f3y or f3 is minus nine plus f4y is equal zero 
So F4y is minus 4, uh, 0.43 Newton. Then we can draw that one. So we know exactly how to draw F4 now as a vector addition of F4x plus F4y. Then you can calculate a hypotenuse, which is F4, and calculate angle theta, which is 10 negative 1 of 0 0.43, which is opposite over adjacent, which is 0 0.33, and angle there is 52.5. So we know now that F4 is actually at that direction and at that magnitude. It's a small magnitude compared to other forces and that angle is 52.5 degrees. The last practice for today is a, a diagram on the right which is already in equilibrium. So an object on which the gravity, force of gravity is 50 Newton. So if you see that there's a there's an object here, and there's a force of gravity, that actually pull that object down, and we have two strings there. Here's the one string, and here's another one at a certain angle, 60 degree. That keeps that object in equilibrium. So what do we do? In order to solve this, we can draw this x and y axis. I always recommend you do not draw on a picture itself. So you can draw a T1, that's a tension of the string 1, for example, label it. And on a certain angle, 60 degree, you draw tension T2. I draw that longer because I'm going to tell you why I draw the T2 longer and T1 shorter. And I'm going to draw a force of gravity at a certain length and I'm going to show you why I chose to draw that at a certain length because as you practice more and more, you actually expect how long that force would be. Then you can resolve T2 in two components because it is not on X or not on Y as a T1 or FG you don't need to do it T1 is actually T1X and T1Y is 0 doesn't exist for FG it's always on a Y axis so you never uh, do that for FG unless it's an inclined plane I'll, I'll talk about it later on So, draw component and calculate it. So, if you take a look there, I did draw FG exactly what was expected to be T2Y because the, those are only two forces on the Y axis. So, they must cancel each other. So, F net Y, if you see, You see here, F net Y is a T2Y plus FG is equal to zero. So remember that it's a sum of forces. So that's why you use plus, although we know that FG is negative. So FG is down and T2Y is up. So if you, uh, if you solve for T2Y, it's equal minus FG. So T2Y, since that FG is minus 50 Newton, is down. So T2Y has to be plus 50. Now, T2Y can be used to find T2. As you know, that T2Y is, a, is a opposite is opposite for this angle 60. 
So that means T2Y is equal to T2 sine 60. From here, you can find T2, which is T2Y divided by sine 60, or 50 divided by sine 60 is equal 57.7. Now, as we are done with T2, we're looking for T1. So T1, we can solve it using that F net X is equal to zero. So if you take a look, F net X is zero. That means that T1 is equal to T2 X. However, uh, let's try to find T2x first. If you see that T2x and T2y are respectively uh, adjacent and opposite. So we know that tan is equal opposite over adjacent. So tan 60. So tan 60 here is opposite divided by adjacent. So opposite is T2Y, which we know already is, it is uh, 50, and T over T2X. So from here, T2X is T2Y divided by 1060, which is 50 Newton divided by 1060 is equal to 28.87. And now you see, based on the angle and based on diagram, that T2x is smaller than T2y. That's why I draw T1 at the same length as a T2x, because they has to be the same. Why? Because F net x is equal to sum of those two forces. T1 plus T2x is equal to zero. So T2 T1 has to be equal to T2x and has to be equal to 28.87. So we know now T1 is 28.87 and T2 57.7. And that's about for this lesson. That's about it for this lesson.